So my topic is, uh, is uh, a difficult one, is try to predict the future, which I'll try. Um, and, as, and as they often say, Alan Kay quoted, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so we're doing this in this room today. Uh, we're going to invent how we're going to be treating glaucoma, and interventional glaucoma hopefully is part of that. Uh, I have been privileged to work with many industry partners. These are my disclosures, and it's been a great journey um, innovating. It's also shown some challenges as well, and we kind of get through them together. And we appreciate all the support as well. So, yeah, let's talk about the future of interventional glaucoma. Well, of course, before we get into that, we think about where do we use this? When do we do? When do we look at these approaches? You know, and who is best served, and how do we do it? And probably most importantly, which I really appreciated uh, Manisha's video, video, video on in terms of asking why are we here? And I get caught up in this myself. I look at the devices, IOP, outcome measures, and I'm very, I was very pleased. In fact, I was almost a little bit emotional hearing the patient's videos um, and saying, don't give up, you know, don't stop, uh, don't be down, although it's very hard sometimes in glaucoma to do that, and don't be discouraged as well. Um, have a healthy appetite for criticism, but also strive to innovate and find better ways, because we have to find better ways. And I always, whenever I get challenged to say, Ike, you know, why is this a good idea? I, I always say, well, what is the current idea? Where is status quo today? I think it's very obvious we need, we need to do better in glaucoma. We have to. It's been a life passion for many of us as well. And that really leads us to the goals of our treatment. And I think we are challenged a bit in glaucoma and perhaps you know, not establishing the right success outcome measures for patients. And I think it's coming back to bite us when we, when we look at payers who say, well, why should we cover a certain procedure? So I think getting back to understanding about why we do what we do and developing the right outcome measures is gonna be very important. And I encourage again, not just looking at IOP, not just even looking at blindness rates, but thinking about visual disability. We know patients who have a mild to moderate visual field defect have significant quality of life issues, driving, navigating, even with mild to moderate visual field defects. And of course, our treatments affect quality of life and access continues to be a problem as well. And ultimately, me being Canadian, we're very interested in cost effectiveness in terms of a set limit of funding we have. So we certainly are in the era of glaucoma innovation. We think about medical innovation, we think about all the considerations we do in terms of thinking about where do we go with this? What is our published data and evidence? What needs do our patients have? And what experience do we have as surgeons? And there are many challenges, of course. Cost is an issue. Surgeon acceptance and adaptation. Adoption is a challenge. And just our mindset, thinking differently, uh, gives us headaches, literally. And then there are pitfalls. What are the unknown risks of these novel procedures? What about the significant learning curve in terms of establishing the right efficacy and safety? And our biases that exist with all of us, including myself. I will admit I'm biased toward innovation. And that makes me biased with my collaborators as well. There are also some that are biased toward anti-innovation and, and, and want to be comfortable and stay where they are as well. There's biases for those who are in power, who would rather stay in power and not change. And I won't get political, but these are all important things we need to consider. And of course, I won't go into some of the current mindset we have in glaucoma, but we know it's generally been a bit passive. It's been more you know, you know, basic risk analysis and medications and intervening much later in disease for good reason, because our interventions were not necessarily safe enough for th to think about doing them earlier as well. But there are issues with our, treatment, with our treatment paradigm, and these are just some of them. Some of them are obvious, compliance adherence, ineffective stacking medications, how many patients come to see me and they're already on three or four or five classes of medication, well, the evidence is very weak that the addition of these additional classes really help pressure control. And in fact, they are worse for the ocular tissue and they are worse for compliance. 24 seven control uh, is an issue and we have more evidence on, on those peaks that are damaging. We don't pick up in the office. And I'm very fascinated to think about the histopathology. Like what are we doing with our treatments? Our treatments are helping, but are, what, what impact are they having for the ability to intervene? And there's evidence, of course, when we think about the pathology in glaucoma, at least the trabecular meshwork, that this, is, this changes from a, from a reversible disease to an irreversible disease. From a disease with the meshwork, with ECM, resistance buildup, and increased IOP, to a casket of inflammation and fibrosis and sclerosis that ultimately leads to irreversible dysfunction, whereby which, at least the hypothesis is, that our pharma therapies, our laser therapies, our canal-based procedures don't work very well because the pathology has irreversibly affected this. And are we actually doing a disservice by delaying these therapies is a question I have, as well as the impact of our toxicity on our, on, 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 on our, on our tissue. 
And so the secondary impacts as well of what we're doing and what we don't do, I should say as well, on distal outflow obstruction, how does it affect the procedures we do in the reduction of efficacy because of those secondary changes that occur? This is, I think, where we need to have science come and help us to inform us and understand this as well. And of course, we also know the potential uh, negative effects both outside the eye and inside the eye of our therapies as well. These are why we have to think, th think differently. And as I often remind myself, uh, you know, we're only young once. I'm realizing that more and more as I get older. Now, glaucoma is only young once. We only have one chance to really potentially impact the outcome of that patient's life before it gets too late. And are we missing opportunity by not intervening earlier? And I think the idea of intervening earlier and, and affording a greater benefit over a patient's lifetime and even potentially be disease modifying at the level of the outflow as well as, of course, our, our nerve and visual function is a premise behind early intervention. And as I said before, we know interventional therapies work better in earlier disease and for, probably for good reason, as we've mentioned as well. So interventional glaucoma is very much a, a mindset approach, thinking of a proactive procedural approach to treating early. And I will say again, this is somewhat aspirational and, and certainly, uh, you know, hypothesis and not established uh, paradigms. But my goal, I, I guess I have the freedom to talk about what I think the future is, which nobody knows. So elevated pressure being an interventional problem, let's think about how we think treatment may change by intervening first line before medications, going in the eye perhaps if we can establish long-term safety, which we still, of course, need to show. What about non-incisional ways to perform MIGs and moving MIGs earlier in the treatment options as well. And of course, we already know the potential benefit of combined FACO MIGs as well. And also novel bleb surgery when we have to go bleb. But I certainly would like to see, uh, you know, blebs uh, further and further pushed away because we know the challenges with long-term issues with blebs and, and infection rates. So we're moving, I hope, from a reactive to a proactive approach. But we still have issues with when. It's nice to see the technology, but we still struggle to know when do we use these technologies balancing safety and efficacy and cost and access. And we need to think about our patient not as one static person or, 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 or point in their journey. The journey is very long and arduous. And we have an opportunity to consider intervention at any point in this, in this journey. And those of us who, who treat patients, we know, of course, we see patients in all types of this position. And where our interventions best work is where we need to, again, build the right science to help to inform us. But the journey is important. And also thinking about what should go when and what order is important as well, preserving the best approach uh, at the right time of the patient's journey. And so our established journey has already been discussed. And again, as, as I said before, we may, we may consider a different journey where we're intervening and perhaps medications are used more as a bridge between different interventions when we need to go from one to the next to the next rather than the other way around. Could this be the future if we, again, establish the right safety and efficacy, which, again, I will say we are lacking. And I challenge ourselves and I challenge our industry partners and I challenge regulatory and payers to push as a society to build and help us to get the right evidence. Because right now it's a bit like shooting from the hip. And we see what happens when, that, when, that, when we do that. So choosing wisely is important. As much as we're excited about technology, we have to do it in the smart and strategic manner, the right procedure for the right patient at the right time. And that's the future, actually, is actually understanding that very much. I think that we'll be helped with the appropriate surgical diagnostics to determine where the problems are in our elevated IOP paradigm by establishing the right genotype and phenotype for patients with paired with diagnostics. We can figure out the right procedure to do with the right prognostic factors and the right approach, and hopefully optimize our outcomes as well. And certainly, you know, the ability to personalize the approaches based on these factors allows for the interventional approaches to be uh, personalized and individualized. Again, using genetics, big data, individual data, and AI will hopefully help us in this era, leveraging technology and big data. Interventional glaucoma is, again, an approach that we're looking at trying to do things earlier, get them lower, do things safer, and address adherence as well. But this is not about a particular technology. This is very much, I think, a mindset of thinking about proactive versus reactive, using early, better predictive diagnostics, looking at advanced monitoring. We're going to hear about this today. Intervening early and more aggressively, doing it wisely and safely and earlier addressing some of the challenges with current therapies as well. 
So what does this mean practically speaking? Well, the approach again is not being defeatist, I hope, and thinking about waiting for progression and then reacting. We already are behind the game when we do this, unfortunately. Avoid stacking medications, but they're not really helping patients, and then knowing when to intervene at the right time is what we hope to achieve. And although we have some rudimentary risk analysis, I think the ability to incorporate more you know, genotype and phenotype factors will be important to, again, develop the right predictive models for when to intervene using AI as well. Because the worst thing is to do is intervene in the wrong patient at the wrong time and cause more harm. And that's, we see this happen in medicine, as exciting as, as it may be. And monitoring is important. I think I'm, I've experienced and I'm very excited about the ability for patients to take control of their monitoring in the eye with sensing and at home and the ability to metabolically image by looking at stress cells in the tissues of interest in the retinal uh, ganglion cell and the optic nerve is very exciting. We'll hear about this today as well. Pay attention to this stuff. We will hopefully be able to detect things before they die and thus will help us again to know when to intervene. And of course, there's all the technologies that are out there on intervention. We've already heard about them as well. And that's where perhaps a lot of the early work has made us think about this. The future, though, is predicated on safety. We've already seen the withdrawal of products. We've seen the damage products can cost other tissues. And so we need, again, the right science. And we do thank uh, our regulatory bodies. As no, I know that there's always people who complain about that. And we obviously want to try to optimize that, but we appreciate the importance of safety because that is our, is our, is our, is our, is our moral and, and medical compass as well. I hope that interventional therapies, though, do address safety. And this is being more established with trabeculoplasty, will need to be for sustained release, MIGs, and other approaches as well. And we've moved again on first line. We've seen SLT move first line. We've seen the evidence build very strongly as well. And we've seen MIGs and MIBs move early as well for good reason because of, again, a longer track record. And I'm proud to see the publications that have come out that I think are fairly high quality, long-term high quality randomized studies where the evidence is building for both laser and MIGs to be a safe pressure lowering medication reduction, but also protecting visual fields and intervening less with major surgery is a benefit. Because even when we lower pressure with non topical therapies, there's something that's different, that's magical, that protects patients in a better way, and perhaps may alter the course of disease for reasons we mentioned as well. And so I think all of these considerations and this new therapeutic mindset is the future of interventional glaucoma. But we have a lot of work to do, and as someone who really loves reading and loves reading studies and clinical trial design, I hope we incorporate more health quality outcomes, patient report outcomes, cost effective outcomes, and the proper high quality data. We need this and certainly more than ever, certainly at pairs think. And I think I'll leave you with one thought that certainly in my career I've seen that the biggest challenge to effect change isn't technology, it's really us. It's really us as human beings and it's natural. We like to stay comfortable, it's more convenient. But there are resistance and there are barriers that we need to consider and overcome. And some of these are well established and the cultural change is happening already in front of us, which is great and exciting. So maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but I hopefully I've given some thoughts about what the future may be like for interventional glaucoma. I also want to say that this is not about bashing medication and trabeculectomy. Medications will have a role and topical draws for a very long time in my estimation. And trabeculectomy is still very important. I do TRABs regularly every week because our patients need it because they're that bad. But hopefully the time will come when we don't need these, to do these in these patients because they're not that bad when they, when, they, when they follow up with us. And there are a lot of technology leaps that are happening in this space that meld well with intervention. Diagnostically, we don't know what we're, what we're seeing. We're, we're operating blindly, so to speak. We're not addressing wound healing right. We're not visualizing right. And of course, genes, cell-based therapy, neuroprotection protection are all very exciting in this area. So thank you for listening to me. And again, I appreciate the honor of being here Great work from GRF and great work from the team here. It's an honor to be here and a privilege to be amongst all of you. I feel we're one family working together. Thank you very much.